Continuing our uh, the topic of our previous discussion on Sir Philip Sidney and his contribution to English criticism or the growth of English criticism, we will again today see a few of uh, the more prominent parts of uh, uh, his apology for poetry. Okay, so in our previous video we saw uh, a little bit about the writer when he left and who he was. He was both um, you know, a courtier, Elizabethan courtier. He made a name for himself in the Elizabethan court and um, he was a poet. He wrote quite a bit and then he was a scholar and also a soldier and died out of a wound in the Battle of Zutphen. All right. Uh, he, and in his very brief career, we could call it brief many because he lived, didn't live beyond 31 years of his age. In his brief career, he wrote a variety of works. We cannot call it extensive, expansive, uh, you know, set of uh, mm. <coughs> um, expansive set of works. But uh, he did write in a different genres. He wrote Astrophil and Stella, an apology for poetry, a critical work, and Arcadia, and Sydney songs. So he included both romance and spiritual works. Then we looked at why Sidney was prompted to write his critical work uh, defending poetry mainly because this Puritan Stephen Garson you know dedicated a work which intended to attack all poets okay all poets and poetry so in response to Stephen Garson's attack Sidney wrote the apology for poetry as or the defense of poetry as it is otherwise called okay sources the main sources of Sydney because Sydney did not have any uh, English references to make English critical references to make so he draws upon um, the ancient classics and Italian writers classics as in, uh, from the Greeks and Romans and the Italian writers of Renaissance okay Greeks and Romans from uh, around uh, you know fourth fifth century BC and Italians of the Renaissance period so he basically his references come from Homo, Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch, mainly from uh, Pluto, uh, Plato and Aristotle quite a bit, and uh, he f he follows Galliger and Castelvetro from Italians, and uh, and he also made note of Ovid's uh, Ovid and Horace, like uh, he <coughs> sort of gave a new life to Ovid's dossier de lectendo, you know, that is to teach and delight. So that's how he sort of differs from Aristotle, okay? But as Aristotle believed that the main purpose of poetry is to delight, Ovid also believed that poetry has to teach as well as delight, right? And even Horace, Horace of, was of the same belief, okay? It has to, poetry has to entertain and enlighten. So, you see, uh, Sydney's ideas and opinions have a, a far... Uh, you know, more mature or far more wider than you could see in Plato or Aristotle. Mainly because of the gap in time, because it has been more than 2000 years since Plato and Aristotle wrote. Till the time Sydney came into the picture, it had been almost 2000 years. So you could say that all the, the body of work that Sydney was exposed to, okay, at a later date, it far exceeds anything Plato or Aristotle could have imagined. Okay, so you could say that Sydney's work is far more expansive comparatively. Okay, now the main argument of his book, okay, the main argument of his book in the sense uh, the method, uh, what, what method he, because he, he chose to reply to Gosson, not very directly, but indirectly, making references and, you know, using indirect, uh, you know, indicating or, or in, in, giving implicit arguments rather than explicitly defending it because that would be more crude okay um yeah he defended poetry quite a bit in his own way and he makes various distinct distinctions he speaks of the various genres of poetry that are advantageous to men all right men as in like people in general he spoke about pastoral elegies, satire, comedy, tragedy, lyric, epic, and each one has its own, you know, beautiful way of uh, moving men to doing goodness, or feeling good, or being good. And uh, 
again he addressing the four main charges leveled by Carson he speaks of how you know uh, no learning is better than poetry mainly because poetry teaches and moves to virtue and then he also speaks of how undoubtedly undoubtedly he is true I mean uh, you know quite uh, um, it's it's quite an appropriate statement considering he was not even exposed to Shakespeare because Shakespeare was still a novice or or he must not even have entered you know um, the higher circles of um, uh, of the uh, of the players of, during Sydney's time so obviously he was not familiar with Shakespeare's work but if he had seen you know the quality of mercy speech. From the Merchant of Venice, this he would have, you know, he would have been justified in writing this. Okay, he would have felt justified. He is justified undoubtedly, but he would have, well, you know, been more justified in writing this. And he speaks about how, you know, uh, as far as the accusation of a veracity is concerned, as an honesty is concerned in Stephen Gosson's work, Sydney believes that, you know. There is no question of veracity because the poet is not dealing with facts. Okay, the poet is dealing with a higher truth, which is beyond facts. And also, he speaks about how, how poetry is not abusing men; it's the man's wit that is abusing poetry. And uh, of course, speaking of Plato, he says how Plato will be a patron because poetry was against not poetry in general or poets in general, but he only wanted to banish poets who were abusing poetry okay, or, or creating false images of uh, gods and goddesses that were not right true, quite true. Now we will look into, to, in today's class, we'll look into Sydney's classism, especially his respect for rules. Okay, So as I said earlier, that he was drawing mainly from the, uh, from the ancient classics and Italian writers, we can argue that um, he had a great respect for the classical rules. Okay, he, so he tried to apply classical rules to English poetry, and he also believed that the poet was a maker and a prophet. Why? Because the Grecians and Romans believed that a poet was not merely a writer; he was a maker, as in something because he is involved in the creative process. Okay, a maker is a you know a far respectful respectable place to be okay and he was a prophet as in he idealized a concept that which could at some point come true in rome a poet was considered as a prophet something a prophet is someone who gives prophecy right someone who tells you what could happen what may happen right so poet envisages a point of time where things could be ideal, where things could be better than they are, right? So listening to him, probably people might reform for the better. So he could be a prophet, someone who tells you good tidings, someone who could tell you how, how to be better. It was given a very important task. Now, English poets are being attacked by people like Stephen Gosson. Why? Because English poets are not taking their job of being a maker and a prophet seriously. The English poets need to conceive worthily. Conceive worthily as in they need to think, they need to prepare, they need to make things worthily. It has to be worthy. Okay? It, not, it should not just be frivolous. It should not be ridiculous in any sense it should not make you know poetry not worthy what kind of poetry is not worthy the one that is vulgar in thought the vulgar in act you know it is it or the kind of poetry that is of no use to anyone except for creating false images of the world there is no point in reading that kind of poetry the poetry the kind of poetry that makes you feel elevated somehow where that, that which elevates your soul, that refines your taste, that refines your mind, English poets need to create that kind of poetry. And they need to follow worthy models. Okay? They need worthy models as in they cannot simply rely on 
you know, the unrefined, coarse, crude models of poetry because ultimately they will end up, you know, creating such crude poetry themselves. So they need to follow worthy models if they were to achieve such standards available only at such standards. And those standards are available only in the ancients. Okay. So I don't know how justified he is in saying that those are, uh, you know, standards available in ancients. But yes, they might have been poetry that were good, that were morally elevating. So he says that those standards were available only in the ancient and the Renaissance Italy. Okay. <coughs> so he made references to the Italians and the Greeks and Romans of the 5th century. Or 4th, 5th, 5th century he uh, laid down rules that were put forth by Plato, Aristotle, Horus, and Dante Boccaccio and Petrarch, Boccaccio, Petrarch, they were all from Italy. Okay. So he had great regard for Plato mainly as the, as the teaching function of poetry. Okay. So Plato believed that the main function of poetry is to teach, right? So and uh, and any other thing, like, you know, any other form of pleasure derived from poetry would be secondary, according to Plato. So, um, <coughs> Sidney himself believed that Plato was right in assuming that the, teaching, the main function of poetry is to teach. And he was also impressed by Plato's theory of ideas and he built upon theory of ideas, as we would see later in this video, how he built upon it. And, uh, and he also, uh, uh, you know, favored this one assumption of Plato where uh, Plato believed that flesh hampers soul in its progression to perfection. Okay, As in, our soul is looking for perfection. We all, any poet for that matter, or even normal humans, normal models like us, we are looking for perfection. Our souls are looking for perfection. But our flesh is an impediment. It's, it hampers this progress, this progression. How does the flesh here would imply the the, the worldly, uh, you know, <coughs> lures, uh, lures, as in like how we are lured by all the beautiful things around us, which may or may not be good for us. We are lured by those and we our soul is hampered in, in its progression to perfection. We're tempted away from perfection. So uh, Plato, uh, Plato's teachings have a great impact on uh, Sydney, following Aristotle, so we are looking at individual people, okay, so uh, following Aristotle, he speaks of mimesis, so he was, in, uh, he approved of the idea that, you know, poetry is the art of imitation, and its main purpose is to teach and delight as far as Aristotle is concerned, okay, teach more than delight, uh, sorry, it was Plato's idea that it has to teach, Aristotle believed that it has to delight and any teaching <coughs> any teaching that it could impart is purely accidental and he was okay with the theory of accidental teaching right so uh, he oh, Sidney makes reference to Aristotle's opinion of the function of poetry as well and the method of writing in terms of poetry is the main function so he makes reference to the uh, especially his focus is on action because that is what Aristotle stressed upon. There has to be a unity in action. It cannot diversify. It cannot move away from the point of action. It cannot include frivolous topics, unnecessary topics that are not instrumental in progressing the action. Right. So he, his main, Sydney's main focus was on the unity of action. And following Castelvetro's, see, uh, there were so many people who interpreted Aristotle in so many different ways. So Castelvetro in Italian, his in, following his interpretation of Aristotle, Sidney uh, agreed that the, you know, the play, any play, any good play, should follow a single revolution of the sun. Because see, Castelvetro, he not only focused upon the unity of action, he also strongly believed in the passing reference made by Aristotle on the unity of time. Passing reference. Because see, you have to remember that Aristotle did not imply in any sense that it is necessary for the play to have 
uh, to, uh, to stick to the unity of time or unity of place. Aristotle mainly impressed upon the unity of action, not on unity of time or place. Please do keep this in mind when you are reading this. Okay, but later writers, later critics, they, uh, the, especially the Renaissance writers, they began to, uh, we could not call it misrepresent, but uh, gave it equal, started giving it more importance, started giving both unity of time and place equal importance along with unity of action, uh, which is quite not, uh, you know, um, not, not really favorable, it does not really put Aristotle's opinions in a very favorable light because unity of action, as any logical person would understand, is a necessity. Whereas uni unity of time and place would be would ru totally ruin uh, most of uh, the masterpieces with, with, that we have seen so far, whether it be Shakespeare or, or, or any modern writer uh, now. So it cannot center upon one single revolution of the sun or 24 hours and single place of action. It is not quite possible. But then Castelvetro, the following Castelvetro's uh, interpretation of Aristotle, uh, Sydney looks into this point as well. Uh, any place should have a single revolution of sun or 24 hours. It should be concluded in this period and it should stick to one place of action, which is <coughs> preposterous to say the best. Um, speaking of Sydney's classicism in respect for rules, we'll also look into <coughs> Sydney's, um, you know, following Sidicides' interpretation of Aristotle, another critic. Uh, along with Castelvetro's influence, we see that Sydney praises Garbeduck. Okay, Garbeduck was uh, one of the plays uh, written before uh, his, uh, Sydney's time. And it was a tragedy. tragedy? Uh, although you could say a crude form of tragedy. Okay? A crude form of tragedy, it still holds significance because it was one of the main tragedies. It sort of laid down the foundation for the, uh, uh, the following <coughs> of the following century or, or the following tradition of uh, tragedies, writing tragedies. So Sydney praises Corbett, though it does not conform to the unities, but it was written written in the Senecan technique. So uh, Seneca or a Roman uh, Stoic philosopher, Stoic philosopher, uh, who wrote in first century AD, he, his uh, writings became the models for the revival of tragedy on the Renaissance stage, okay. So Senecan technique um, is was you know followed very closely in Garbatic because it, it was basically Senecan technique would include a lot of uh, supernatural elements and quite a bit of melodrama. So it was the only tragedy written till then. So Sydney had no other basis for comparison. Say Sydney, if Sydney had waited, you know, lived uh, say um, maybe 20, 30 years more. He must have become, uh, you know, familiar with the actual tragedies, true tragedies written by King Lear that far surpassed anything that was written before his time. So, so Sidney was not familiar with Marlowe or Shakespeare, so he had no basis for comparison. Hence, he praises Corbett up here. He derided tragic comedy for not conforming to the unity of action. See, tragic comedy was a, a very newly developing form of writing during Sydney's time and he was not very fond of it. Any, any new thing is you know looked at with suspicion right any new genre or form of writing is looked at with suspicion so since he was Sydney was strongly grounded in classics he had a you know he was not very fond of tragic comedy as such mainly because not conforming to the unity of action unity of action action as in unified see in tragedy the, the whole plot revolves around certain misfortune okay that befalls the protagonist and how the protagonist suffers and, uh, and ultimately uh, <coughs> doomed yeah and it ends in tragedy tragedy is supposed to end in a tragic circumstance of the protagonist whereas comedy it has to have a very um, uh, has to have a levity uh, that that uh, centers uh, around the protagonist that borders on humor and wit and 
and all, all the um, all the things that later on culminate into a happy ending okay there might be a little confusion in the middle but even that is of a very light nature so when you mix tragedy with comedy what would happen the action is not unified right as put forth by aristotle the action goes from being tragic to comic in a moment and the levity and the gravity of the tragedy is lost in comedy making it ridiculous at least the coarse forms of tragic comedy as seen earlier that is before sydney's time they were not worthy of being commented upon hence we could say that sydney was justified in deriding tragic comedy okay whereas you know oh, see he says <coughs> he derided tragic tragic comedy for not conforming to the unity of action nor creating the right emotion what was the right emotion required for a tragedy it has to stimulate your pity and fear right so do you feel pity or fear when you watch tragic comedy no you're sad in the beginning you may feel horrible in the middle and but ultimately you become happy about it you you are satisfied in see the, he calls them these gross absurdities neither right tragedies nor right comedies mingling kings and clowns mongrel tragic comedy is obtained mongrel as in you know a, 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 a kind of a lower breed that is not pure bred mongrel would be a dog right a dog that is not pure bred some something that is you know of a low breed quality uh, of a mixed breed so he co- he calls tragic comedy a mongrel okay so he is not comfortable looking at tragedies turning into comedies he is not comfortable looking at clowns mingling with kings uh, so he, he says it is not pure so that it, it, and he could be justified here mainly because he was not familiar with with the kind of a tragic comedy that was produced later on by shakespeare okay now uh he his outlook on unities and on to sum it up okay his is to sum it up to sum it sum up his respect for rules we could say that his outlook on unities and on tragic comedy depended largely on the absence of really good english plays during his time he was not given enough material to work on and despite his fascination with the classics he was himself an elizabethan in his heart you see he wo- he was um a learned scholar of classics so obviously he had tastes that were in conformity with the classics with the, with the roman the greek and greek and the italian works but being an elizabethan he was influenced by the trend of his time with by, by his contemporary practices okay which is quite visible uh, in his sonnets and lyrics okay even though his critical work may look up to classics his heart was totally into the elizabethan culture of writing lyrics all right um he advocated classical meters sydney's classicism included not only his respect for rules his focus was also a little bit on classical meters so classical meters would mean that uh, see the english tradition was for rhyming all the versification at least before uh, before spencer or before marlowe or uh, shakespeare the, who who all of these people marlowe shakespeare and all those people all those writers they depended not on rhyming Okay, but had this unrhymed verses that were far superior to the rhymed quality of other verses. Okay, or of the uh, of the other kind. So he advocated Sidney advocated classical meters. Being a member of Areopagus, Areopagus was a uh, sort of a club, club as in uh, was a group of people. You could not really uh, we we don't have any physical evidence. of it being an institution an organized institution per se but there have been discussions among certain people including sydney now we understand that um he was sydney was a member of areopagus and uh, 
the main purpose of this institution, uh, if you could call it that, was the reformation of poetry. Okay, they looked into literature of how to develop and make it more purposeful, more refined. That was the main um, purpose of uh, Ari the the members of the Arab Packers. Now, Sydney, being the member of Arab Packers, he was concerned with the reformation of the poetic form with classical rules. He believed that the English poetry, though good in itself, was far too simple. It could be made better with the application of classical rules. Classical rules as in applying the classical meters and all the rules that were devised by the, uh, you know, the classical writers. Championed the unrhymed classical verse. Unrhymed classical verse, you, you could find the unrhymed classical verses in Shakespeare's blank verse or um, you know even in Pope but before before Sydney there were very few people who had used unrhymed classical verse in English poetry and believed that meter is but an ornament so applying meter itself is merely an ornament to make poetry beautiful and because he, he says there have been many excellent poets that have never versified and now swarm many versifiers that need never answer to the name of poets you get it? There have been many excellent poets. There are plenty of poets who are really good but have never versified. But now, that is during Sydney's time, swarm. There are plenty of like, you know, buzzing bees. There are so many versifiers who create verses, so many rhyming verses that need never answer to the name of poets. He is making a mockery of all the poets who call themselves poets because they do not have any profundity of thought but merely rely on the physical appearance of poetry what is the physical appearance of poetry that it rhymes right so these people who call themselves poet they are not poets mainly because they rely on the external ornament alone without any basic profundity of the thought whereas there have been so many poets excellent poets who never versified but the language itself the thought itself is poetic enough to justify them as poets. So it is not rhyming and versing that maketh the poet no more than a long gown maketh an advocate. Just, just because you get to wear the long gown, you know, the black gown that the advocates wear, uh, the lawyers wear, I, I, so, so just because you get to wear that, you do not become an advocate, right? So a poet does not become a poet, a person does not become a poet just because he is rhyming and versing. Like an advocate, like a person who wears a long gown and he doesn't become an advocate. Who though he pleaded in armor should be an advocate and no soldier. Who though he pleaded in armor. So a person who is wearing an armor should be a soldier. But he, if he is pleading, you know, wearing an armor, he is more an advocate than a soldier. He, it, he, uh, more than a soldier, he could be an advocate. So you see, it is not what we appear that matters, it is what we do, all right? So the appearance, the ornament, the external embellishments are merely just external. They are superficial at best. They do not, they do not go to the core of a person, all right? So what you appear is entirely, you know, useless. What matters is what you are from within. Now again, he says, poetry is not, is art of inventing new things. Poetry is an art of inventing new things better than this world has to offer. So it's not just about imitating the world. So poetry has to invent new things better than what the world has. His personal taste is English as is seen his poetry and even his, uh, you know, his, see, there, there, is, uh, there at one point he says, he is ashamed of his barbarousness in his love for Chevy Chase, for its rhyme and verse. Uh, it, see, this particular poetry bel uh, uh, relied largely on rhyming. Okay, Ballad of Chevy Chase relied largely on rhyming. So he feels barbarous about it. He is sorry for, a little bit sorry for his English taste. But and he also says that poetry is superior to prose. So no matter how well the prose expresses a certain point, the same could be expressed better in poetry. Because in matter they passed all in all, so in manner go to, to go beyond them. 
not speaking words as they chanceably fell from the mouth, but pacing, pacing, weighing each syllable of each word by just proportion according to the dignity of the subject. See, in matter, in manner, in every sense, poetry goes far superior to prose, mainly because they do not they don't they do not occur as speaking words as they chanceably they do not fall as chants okay from the mouth but each word is weighed so when you make a metrical composition and uh, with the idea with a certain idea in your head you are weighing every single syllable to match the one in the other syllable in the uh, in the uh, previous verse right so every single syllable is weighed by just proportion according to the dignity of the subject depending on the dignity of the depending on the gravity of the subject each syllable is weighed it's not like prose in that sense so poetry is far superior to prose according to sydney again he says for poetry sweetness and orderliness defending the poetry sweetness and orderliness it says it is being best for memory you know we have this uh, tendency to learn things better when it is in verse form instead of remembering things in prose as in uh, as in the normal prose we tend to remember things better when it is presented to us in um in in verse form being best for memory the only handle of knowledge it must be in jest that any man can be speak can speak against it being best for memory you know poetry is best for memory it teaches us but and also helps us remember we may read a great deal about uh, you know kindness or a great deal about childhood and or about solitude or about keeping peace or about neighbors for we must have read so much so much in prose form but whenever we think of all of these we are mostly reminded of Wordsworth and Frost and when you know Pope and Dryden or Milton or Shakespeare for that matter. Yes, we remember things that have been presented in verse form. The same things that have, we may have read million times in prose form, we remember it better, and we we remember the instances in where they those same concepts have been presented in poetry. Balanced opinion on both unrhymed classical meters and rhymed English poetry. So he had a very balanced opinion on classical meters as well as, well as rhymed English poetry. So he, so he did not binge on either of these. So though he was, you know, happy and he, though, though he was, uh, he championed uh, the cause of unrhymed classical meters, he was also happy with the rhymed English poetry. Love of classics reconciled with his love of the native tradition. Native tradition would be the English tradition of writing. Though he had a major love for the classics themselves, they were ultimately reconciled in his apology for poetry. Now, uh, looking into the value of Sydney's criticism, we can see that he, though he borrowed heavily from Aristotle, he also diverged from Aristotle in the sense that Aristotle believed that poetry is merely an imitation, okay, for the specific purpose of delight here uh, diverging from Aristotle he says poetry is an art of imitation for a specific purpose to teach and delight okay he di uh, uh, there is a divergence here again diverging from Aristotle he believes that poet not only imitates nature as put forth in uh, in the concept of mimesis by Aristotle of course the poet imitates nature but he not only imitates nature but creates forms such as never were in nature. So the poet goes according to Aristotle, the poet goes one step further as was believed by Aristotle. So what happens in poetry, he does not merely see lovers, a poet sees truer lovers, more constant friends, as in you wouldn't find these kind of people in your real life. Okay, whatever nature offers you in terms of the people around you. Yeah. The poet offers a more purer version, more truer version. So the poet, the, the poet, in poetry you see true lovers, more constant friends, braver warriors. The warriors that you see in normal life are 
melee warriors. They may be brave, they may be covered, they may be a mixture of both. But what you see in poetry is brave warriors, unlike anything you might find in reality. Again, more just rulers. Rulers are well, and they are righteous, they are corrupt, there are all kinds, there are mixtures of both. But in poetry, you could find more just rulers and more excellent men. What you find in poetry is models of excellent men, which you may not find in real life. So what poet is doing is he not only imitating nature, but he is creating a form that is not found in nature. So poetry is not so much an art of imitation as of invention or creation. Then poetry is not merely an art of imitation. It is more of invention and creation. So closer to Plato, his vision of an idea is rather than a copy of a copy of an idea. So we could say that taking it from Aristotle, he moves closer to Plato because Plato believed that, you know, all poetry is merely copy of the thing and the thing itself is the copy of an idea, right? Here, we see Sydney going a little closer to Plato in the sense that that he he makes makes us believe or at least convinces us that a poet is creating a vision okay he is creating a vision that far surpasses any idea he is creating a vision for an idea that idea would turn into the copy of the thing okay would turn into a copy which would be the thing all right so he carries the poets or the poetry itself beyond idea you know before idea so uh, this is all for today thank you stay safe be happy assalamu alaikum